today for Earth Day that we would have a conversation, the two of us, about the Earth Crisis support groups that have come out of your newest book, uh, Confessions, and um, uh, is the, the, it is the appendix of the book and the guidelines for the Earth Crisis support groups are in that appendix. And um, thank you very much for you invited me to write the last chapter of the book asking can women save Christian discipleship and my answer was yes. And you and I talked as we were um, thinking about this for several months thinking, huh, what, you know, how could this book be a curriculum or uh, how could this book, ah, uh, blah, you know, we, we were just stumbling around in the dark. And then uh, we landed on this idea that instead of making it about anything Christian, because you have taught us, John, you have modeled us for many years, and uh, that we cannot be working with Christians or Unitarians or Republicans or, you know, the Americans. We need to work with the Chinese and the Americans and the Republicans and the Democrats and the Presbyterians and the Sufis and the, everybody. And the great thing about this crisis is that everybody is more and more increasingly being affected by it, having an awakening of the problems. Uh, getting really in touch, I think more and more people are about their grief, about uh, their um, collusion. We are all in collusion with the destruction of the sixth extinction of life on earth, the only one created by humans. And we all know we're a part of that. And uh, none of us are innocent. We're all participating in that. And in that way, when we think about it, it's easier because we can forgive ourselves and others and really begin to work with everyone young and old, you know, the, the clever and the mentally handicapped, everyone is being affected by this, whether they know it or not, <laughs> consciously. And um, we all have a role to play. We all have gifts that are needed in the awakening and then the empowerment of changing course uh, here on the Titanic as we head for this iceberg. So, Easter, you preached for us and you gave us hope. And the hope is that there were people after this great trauma and this great suffering and this horrific injustice um, uh, in this time of, you know, the horrors of the Roman Empire. And here we are living in the horrors of the American Empire and the horrors of capitalism and the horrors of, you know, ecosystem collapse and the extinction of this species, etc., etc. And, uh, we are still walking around and we're still here wanting to worship and praise God and come together in celebration every Sunday here in our our little church you know in the barn and sometimes you know on the road we're dancing with the animals and we're sharing food with them and with our neighbors and with one another so it's just a miraculous thing you know people have survived these horrific things and they have only survived if they have supported one another in loving communities. So it is this um, great story of the wedding banquet. I was just telling John, you know, as a minister, I just feel like all I've done for decades is just invite people, invite people, invite people, and half the time nobody comes, you know? You do these fabulous programs or whatever, really, really brilliant sermons and then nobody shows up or like a handful or something like that but it doesn't matter right because if the people that you thought wanted the message and wanted the support group and wanted the church service don't want it then you just go and invite somebody else isn't that right john cobb <laughs> we'll keep inviting them too oh yeah everybody's invited <laughs> but I, think, I really think this story uh, this parable of Jesus is really about what we're dealing with with the Earth Crisis Support Groups. We don't have a budget. We don't have, you know, a, a, you have an international following, so that's why I always thought we'd be better off trying to focus on getting these started overseas. But, you know, I think we're going to start one on May 6th. Everybody's invited. You're coming on Zoom. Anybody can come on Zoom. And then we have a local group in Oregon that's going to gather. But... I think it's really important for us to have hope. Because you said it in the preface, 
you know, is it likely that these Earth crisis support groups could really, you know, just take off and change the world and awaken people and give them the love and support that they need to empower them to go out into the world and do fabulous things? Probably not, but it's possible. And think about Mary Magdalene and, you know, the, 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 the hundreds of people who saw Jesus resurrected, you know? I mean, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. The story of love, the, the, of God's love for us and that love being more powerful than anything else survived Jesus' uh, uh, crucifixion. So I am convinced, John Cobb, that in a similar way, these Earth Crisis Support Groups represent something that can survive our denial and our grief and our suppressed fears. So I don't know. What do you think, John? <laughs> well, I think um, small groups and uh, not, I mean, not all, I mean, the kind of small group that I think is most important is a local one. Uh, that where people can actually be face to face with each other, but also where people can work together to make sure they are all fed, and that the necessities of life are provided. And there's a kind of even emotional support that uh, physical presence is a real contribution to. And I, I think uh, that that our whole world has been going in a direction that has weakened the, the power of local communities. Economically, uh, we all buy things from all over the place. And uh, if we trace the food that we eat at a meal, I've heard that probably on the average, it's traveled a thousand miles. And uh, uh, that if we are dependent on food coming a thousand miles, when transportation is seriously disrupted, we're going to be in real trouble. But if in our local communities, we are producing some food, if we're really producing enough food, we won't have all the variety we like, but we're not going to starve. And I think the avoidance of starvation is probably number one. Now, we need other things beside food, but uh, water may be even more serious and more of a problem. I, I didn't quite understand what's going on with water. In, in your place. We have, let me tell you, because it's exciting. We have a uh, natural water well. Uh -huh. And okay. there, there was a pump and a, even a house over it. And yeah. it hadn't worked in over 25 years. And a very clever gentleman who's a friend of ours, Gilbert, just worked on it for a few minutes and got it to work. He just took some electricity down there and it's working. So then the question is, we have to find out if it's potable water, you know, yes. maybe we can use it for growing plants, but we can't drink it. We don't know any of that yet. So we're yeah. we sent a way to get it tested and we'll probably have to get a water treatment system. But the good news is, even though Oregon has a lot of water, we in the, in the fire season, you know, had terrible fires and we didn't, necessarily have enough water. Our creek dried out for uh, you know several months. So at any rate, it's another source of water for the John Cobb Echo Farm. So it's very exciting. Yes, yes. Well, it's, I, I, I don't ordinarily think of the Northwest as the area going, for which water is going to be the major problem. But I think that having uh, potable water is going to be more difficult as other things get more messed up so that even in the Northwest, it's, it's going to be important not to depend on central <clears throat> suppliers with their purification system, because uh, that may get stopped functioning for one, for one reason or another. So, so local communities are based on face-to-face that really think about what are the things that we would really need 
in in case we cease receiving uh, goods and services from a thousand miles away. That's going to be extremely important. And their ability to survive <clears throat> will still depend on friendly relations with their neighbors. Because if, if you've got plenty of water, but your neighbors don't have any, um, if, if you give them all they need, you may, not, you may all die together. It's going to be a real problem. But if you have what I call communities of communities, there's a chance one can discuss these things in a way that, be, that there will be authentic survival. And survival is, survival is, but, I'm, I'm, very, but it's very difficult to get people to recognize that these are the kinds of questions that are going to be faced in the future. It's, and the, um, the ability to think seriously about matters of life and death and meeting absolutely central needs is um, in short supply. If you start a conversation about this, most people are going to be eager to shift to something that's happening tomorrow or next week. And so we think that having small groups, and in this case, not as important that they be face to face, but it still would help. Have small groups that support each other in sticking to these issues instead of escaping, trying to find an escape from them. And I think that since everybody needs to be able to face the truth and think wisely about it, the number of people who we would like to get involved with these groups is the population of the planet. But I don't think we're going to reach a high percentage of the population of the planet. But if, if even 2% of Americans were involved in groups like this, it would have an enormous effect upon American politics. Mm -hmm. And we might even decide that we didn't have to be emperor of the world. <laughs> you know, that, uh, one of the that, things... Go ahead. I was just going to say, that would reduce the risk of war immensely. Yes. No, I, I, in talking to people about these groups, one of the things that's come up is that I realize that most people have an idea that they would be trying to gather a group of people who thought like they did. And that is, I think, exactly the opposite of what, we're, what, what the vision is. Because I think m most of us have some groups in our lives that are, you know, like a political group that we sort of agree with about some issues, or an ecologic group. That, but I think the idea of a group that it has nothing to do with your politics are, what your education is, what your uh, special needs are, what your race is, what, you know, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with any of those things. It has to do with the recognition that we're in a crisis. Most everybody agrees that we're in a crisis. You know, whatever they, they may not agree on the causes or whatever else, but every, almost everybody will agree on that. And to get people to engage in this deeply spiritual practice which is to actually share the truth about how they're feeling and to really share the truth about what's happening in the world. And, you know, you learn a lot about people when you ask them what's happening in the world and they tell you, you know, whatever their news source is, that it's not the same news source that you're using. And that's not a reason not to be in a group together, you know. Uh, it's, it's actually going to make your group more interesting because it's kind of like church, you know, or it's kind of like families, you know. We don't all think the same. We don't all live the same. And, you know, I found this in our some of our neighbors, for example, John, who, um, you know, have, uh, you know, as we know, there's a lot of real polarization. People who are, uh, you know, very vehemently for things that, uh, you know, I've never, I've never known a lot of people who were for those things. And that is really important that we welcome those people into these groups. Because I think we, many of us, 
that are kind of educated and, you know, like a lot of Unitarian Universalists, a lot of liberal people, are kind of used to being with their own kind. And it doesn't really afford you a lot of spiritual practice. This is what I think the Camp Hill communities have taught me. You know, in a community where people have, some people have special needs where they're intellectually very, very challenged and some people are not, and you have a buy-in that everybody is loved by God and everybody has special needs and everybody needs to be included. Everybody's feelings need to be heard. Everybody's ideas of what's happening in the world need to be heard. So I think that's what makes this different for me. Well, um, potentially. I, I, I'm assuming that in some support groups like the Alcoholics Anonymous, mm -hmm. that there is great variety of political thinking and so forth. So we know sustainability groups don't have to be groups of people who all agree with each yes. other but they do to to join these sustainability groups people do need to recognize that there are real problems yes and that there are that even this even they cannot just count on there always be groceries at the grocery store yes. And they can't turning on a tap won't always work. So if if people don't don't think there's any problem to worry about, just want to be left alone, we'll just leave them alone. There's no right. We, we certainly can't force ourselves, but right. But I think there are an awful lot of people who, at some level of their thinking and feeling, know that the world is in critical mm -hmm. danger and uh, they may they may say the danger is uh, that we will believe that there's a danger or something and uh, whether many local groups can cope with that I don't know we'll try mm -hmm. well it's the same for example in uh, let's say a, a woman's breast cancer support group you know they all may be treated in the same hospital, but they don't certainly have the same socioeconomic or, you know, political ideas or anything else. And there's no problem in people sharing deeply how they're feeling and what's going on in the world. Uh, they probably don't share what's going on in the world, uh, you know, politically, and that's what makes this different. Um, but I, my intuition is, is that we are in increasingly uh, dangerous times and um, you know crisis is an invitation for people to do things differently so I have a feeling some people will recognize when they hear or they receive an invitation you know maybe I should try this you know and they, you know, they might not like it but I have a feeling more and more people are going to be realizing that they really need to uh, be um, more honest with themselves and uh, with other people. So I'd like to model that right now, John, with you and me, because where two or more are gathered. So in our group, we're just going to have a practice group, you and me, and uh, uh, I'm going to start, and I'm going to just share how I'm feeling, and I'm not going to go the full five minutes, which we're going to ask people to do, but I'll just go for you know a little time. And then I'll ask you to do the same. And then I will tell you about what's concerning me in the world. And then you'll tell me what's concerning you in the world. We'll do an abbreviated version. And then we'll, um, then we'll have a party. <laughs> no, not really. But So let's just do those two parts, okay? You game? I think I know what you want. Yeah. But anyway, I'll hear you first. Okay. All right. All right. So the question for me is how I'm feeling personally. And I'll say, first I have to share that I was at the beach and um, with my three beloved grandchildren, we were chasing seagulls. I mean, it was just kind of like, you know, heaven on earth and ecstasy. And then my granddaughter needed to go to the restroom. So I ran up the stairs and I fell on the stairs and I have the biggest knocker on my knee, on my right knee and my left shin. So it was very embarrassing. And all these people came rushing over. Are you okay? Are you okay? Anyway, anyway, and it was like so stunning. It was one of those things where I was like, maybe I've broken my legs. You know, it wasn't that bad. In a minute, I, I sat up and I was fine. So that, I'm still a little 
you know, rough around the edges about that. And then uh, this morning, I participated in a memorial service for my nephew who died of alcoholism. And um, a bunch of alcoholics that organized it. And it was really, really a painful kind of experience. It wasn't as painful for me as for my son, you know, who's younger and, you know, I think he inherited impatience from his mother. So at any rate, we kind of struggled through that, but I was really glad we did it. And then, of course, being here with my uh, children and my, my grown children and my daughter-in-laws. And, you know, my daughter-in-law is expecting another baby, so she's very ill right now in October. So that'll be the... Uh, and we went to Jacob's fifth birthday party. So all of this was really a wonderful experience. But, you know, really honestly, the truth is, these are really complicated family relationships. And so I'm kind of exhausted, you know. And as Walt said when I left, you know, Bunny, I don't want to get all these calls where I have to, like you know, like, talk you down off the edge, you know. <laughs> so, um, it's life, you know. I find it complicated and uh, beautiful, and uh, I feel a lot of, you know, I I've been really touched by Earth Day this year. I just am filled with grief about, you know, the things. Just being here in San Diego, too, and seeing the enormous, you know, it's just so much more congested, and it's just, I, I, you, there's so many signs of you know poverty and stuff. It's just painful. So I'm uh, John. I'm feeling a million different ways. <laughs> How are you feeling? Well, uh, I had thought about dumping on, on everybody, but I'll go back to uh, rather <clears throat> strange event on Friday morning. Uh, in the background of this is that there is a, a TV program, you know, that has apparently tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who sometimes listen to it. <clears throat> and uh, they have, they invited me to be a regular guest so that I would have responsibility every Thursday morning at eight o'clock, a Friday morning at eight o'clock. Well, you know, taking on something like that at this stage of my life raises lots of, lots of questions. Uh, sometimes I think I would like to retire. <laughs> but sometimes I think, well, maybe this is an opportunity to make a difference. So, uh, the, it, th that has led to some th th thinking about how I could retire in some other respects, if this was important. In any case, what happened was, that I got started and everything seemed to be okay, but something went wrong technically. And uh, my voice ended up being all chopped up and people couldn't understand what was being said. The program was ended uh, early and the invitation for a, lo a long-term relationship was ended. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the, these kinds of things, I don't, I, I'm not distressed about it because I wasn't, I wasn't terribly comfortable about making the commitment and this, this way I don't have to make, to make the decision. But um, the, the general sense that I have some things to say that I, I need to sh to share when I can is very much bound up with my sense of how we are all, and I certainly include myself, shooting ourselves in the foot at a time we need to be really worth thinking and working together. I'm most involved in 
trying to get China and the United States not to move farther toward war. I think there are people in the United States who want a war. They, they seem to go out of their way to provoke China. And they have succeeded in humiliating China because Taiwan, which China regards as part of China, is now an American protectorate. And I think that they do this by the threat of nuclear war. And I think they would carry out that threat if, if China did not yield. So I, I have feelings of anxiety and upset and relief and as you were saying, all sorts of other things. And then the fact that um, I can never count on being able to do what I want to do on a computer. <laughs> Sometimes I'm thinking more about that than I am about what's happening in the larger world because it's the I was not sure at one o'clock this afternoon whether I could get on the Google. And I see Ron Hines is here and he saved me. <laughs> so then I stopped thinking about that and became able to worry about <laughs> the, the larger problems. I don't have the feeling that if only people would listen to me, somehow everything would be all right. I don't, I know I don't know. But I do think that, the, that the, the biggest problem right now, globally, is that there are very few people who are acting as if they understood what was happening in the world. And I'm including governments, of course, among those who don't, but universities are even worse. Churches are slightly better than universities, but nothing to brag about. <laughs> so that although there is much more awareness that we are in serious problems today, and this gives me much more opportunity to share my concerns with a wider public than I've had in the past. Nevertheless, the, 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 the situation is not encouraging. <laughs> I, I think that the worse the situation is, the more that having small groups of people who really share honestly with each other, and who think about what they need to do to prepare just themselves to survive that's where they are. And then, of course, also realize that then one group can never survive if, every, if everywhere else things are bad. The more intensely we concern ourselves about our own survival, the more we will understand there have to be global changes. I don't know. Have I said enough to you to know how I feel? Because I don't know how I feel. Thank you. I appreciate it, John. And uh, let's just go into this next part, which is uh, just talk about uh, what's happening in the world. And um, um, one of the things that I, I'm aware of um, that's happening in the world is... Um, you know, my own family is not able to uh, be very uh, present with what's happening in international uh, politics or in American, the American situation. I mean, that, you know, and who can, you know, all the, you know, it's just overwhelming. You know, I, I, feel, I feel obligated to, you know, read the news and watch the news and be informed. I feel like that's the least I can do. And, and um, so, I, you know, I'm aware of all the shootings and the famines and, 
you know, the people that I trust that talk about, you know, threats of war and uh, the refugees and, you know, uh, teen suicide. I don't know. It's just like there's so many horrific problems. So um, I'm just, I, I guess what's happening in the world for me right now that's important is this Earth Day, I've really had a sense of, I guess it was this memorial service too that I did this morning. And um, so I don't know, I think also I just more and more aware of my own sense of, you know, grief about and mourning about um, the destruction of life on Earth, you know, the entire ecosystems. You know, Walt and I, we see these huge trucks, you know, uh, all this logging that's still like, being done, you know, and, and I always say really obnoxious things like, look, you know, there's a, the bodies from the genocide of the trees in the forest, you know. So I, I'm just aware that I'm aware of a lot, locally, nationally, internationally, and um, I don't think I'm ever going to stop that. I, I feel like that's the least I can do, you know, as a, as a global citizen, is to stay somewhat informed. But as far as the issues that are uh, really topical for me right now, um, I think, you know, these countries in Africa, you know, that have had droughts for, you know, four years, and it's like these numbers of people who are dying in famines, this is really upsetting to me, you know. Uh, and uh, then all the creatures that we don't even ever mention, you know. So um, I feel like this great... Um, awareness of the suffering in the world and I just really appreciate being able to talk with other people about it because um, I just don't know many people that are willing to talk about that and I thank you John you you know you've you've I've been able to talk with you over the years about this and um, but uh, I don't know I don't know why I've always had this sense of obligation you know to be informed about everything that's going on. And I'm not the best informed person in the world, but you know what I mean. I, I feel like I sort of have some sense, more of a sense of obligation of knowing what's going on. And um, I'm very concerned. Uh, you know, here I am with my grandchildren. And, um, you know, when we're just a few seconds before midnight on the doomsday clock, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists, you know, I take this kind of stuff really seriously. So thank you, John. I appreciate it. We can just talk about it. Hmm. Well, I, I have um, increasingly felt that the United States is the prime, has the primary responsibility to change mm -hmm. because it is the U.S. goal to dominate the planet that is the reason there is war in Ukraine now. And the reason that there is a danger of a war with China. As I say, China really doesn't want a war because it knows that it will be nukes in terrible ways. And China doesn't have the nukes that can either ward off an attack. So it, it, the, the relation between the US and China is very one-sided at that point. And the old idea that we wouldn't start a nuclear war because it would destroy everybody. Actually, the US would get off fairly, fairly well. I wish, it would, I wish a nuclear war would destroy us because then we wouldn't have one. But I'm very frightened about U.S. policy at the present time. I think that the Americans who realize that we are slipping, that we are no longer clearly number one, that the China-Russia combination is challenging us, the dollar is no longer the only way in which you can survive financially. Many people think that China has shown ability to make things happen 
in the international world that uh, we haven't even tried to do. Uh, the, the, if, if the U.S. is so determined to be number one, it's got to act now. It's, that, it, it is acting in Ukraine, but what's happening in Ukraine is not working out well for the U.S. What I fear is that the the, the true believers that the U.S. should be dominating the world are getting desperate, and their desperation will lead to nuclear war. It, uh, just having having that belief, not that I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying we are treading on the edge all the time. And at least at least I feel I understand what needs to change. The US needs to accept a multipolar world. And I don't think that the American people are totally against that. But the not neocons who took over total control of our foreign policy after 9-11. They are totally controlled, totally against it. And so I think that the I think that being able to see what's happening and who's doing what intensifies the sense of having, seeking opportunities to share, and, but recognizing also how very painful the truth is for us Americans especially, because we have a, a need to feel righteous about ourselves. And that requires that we deceive ourselves in such drastic ways. Okay, let's, on that cheery note, <laughs> we're going to have uh, 30 seconds of our, um, we're going to pretend, we're, oh, I bought the most delicious lentil vegetable soup, and thank you, John, for bringing bread, and we're going to eat, and we're going to have a fun time, we're talking, and then we're going to say, what can we do, what can we do, and then I'm going to say, I know, John Gop, we're going to start Earth Crisis Support Groups, are you in? I'm, I'm a great believer. All right. Okay. We just modeled it. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you.